So thanks for this uh, opportunity to talk about that. This talk is in fact a prequel. You had the sequel, right? Uh, Okosh Jagannath gave a talk, I, if I understand, this week, and he charged. I mean, he asked me to do the prequel, right? and he told you, if I understand well, he told you that the prequel would come. Right? So this is what I'm doing here, and we'll try to relate this in the end to what he described. And uh, but I, I will, I will describe this last part, summar I mean, quickly, because he already gave a a long talk on that, I imagine. So the story is about uh, dynamical spectral transition. The word important here is, the important word is spectral, and the other word, important word is high dimensional. So we're taking SGD, and I want to have a dynamical spectral transition. Of course, the spectral transition I'm talking about is the BBP transition, but it has to be dynamical. So that's what we'll, and we'll see how important it can be. So, uh, here. So this talk is based on this joint work, high dimensional SGD, aligns with emerging outlier eigenspace. So this joint work is with uh, Reza Geisari, my usual uh, suspects on this. Reza is now a professor at Northwestern. Uh, and the usual are with Okosh, whom I just mentioned. And uh, the new addition to this team is Zhao Yang Huang from UPenn. And this is to appear in ICLR. And as I said, Okosh already talked about this uh, work here. But before that, so the prequel is to come back to the work that, that is uh, behind this, which is this work, High Dimensional Limit Theorem for SGD, Effective Dynamics and Critical Scaling, which was with Reza and Okosh, and in uh, NeurIPS last year. And um, uh, which of, which of uh, uh, the full version, the long version, has appeared in Communication in Pure and Applied Math. And of course, you have access to the archive version here. Then, if time permits, so I will do a sequel. If time permits, I will uh, mention more recent work using this uh, with uh, Cédric Gerbelot, who's a postdoc at Courant, and uh, Vanessa Piccolo, who is a PhD student in, in France. <laughs> And uh, here are some two useful earlier references on the same type of thing, again, with Reza and Okosh. That's one that was about, in, in GMLR, was the, uh, on, this work on the online gradient descent, which was, in fact, for single index models. And in particular, where we introduced what is called the information exponent. And in particular, this, there was this older work by, uh, with the same authors uh, in, uh, about tensor PCA. So these are very special things. I will come back to why they are special compared to this general context we're describing now. So here are two other interesting references related to that. So this one by uh, Maria Refinetti, Sebastian Gold, Florent Jacola, and Lenkaj de Borova. And a recent work, which is not directly related to this uh, transition, but could be uh, by uh, Elizabeth Collins Woodfin, whom I don't know. Maybe here, Courtney, Elliot, and Inbar Serussi. So let me come back. So I'll be very fast on that because I imagine everybody knows what I'm talking about here. So stochastic gradient descent. So uh, P and unknown probability uh, on the subset of RD. And then you have a sample of size M. The important thing here is to, the notation. M is the sample size, D is the dimension. And, um, and I have a loss function for whatever it is. Uh, and uh, on the V cross U, V is in the parameter space. The dimension of the parameter space is P. So P, D, M. And the goal, of course, is to find the minimum of the population loss. That is the expectation in this unknown probability, phi of X, the expectation of the exponential uh, of L of X, Y. And uh, of course, one way to do that is to do SGD. So it comes in many variants, I'm sure you know, uh, many batches, learning rate, reuses, all sorts of things. Here I will consider the, uh, the simplest case. As far as possible from the Langevin case we heard. Right? That's from the gradient flow. So here I'm taking the smallest size of batches possible. That is one, batch, one size batch. So online, and I call that online SGD was for the moment a constant learning rate delta. So it's just that. Right? XL is X, uh, the step before, minus delta gradient of this thing 
on the, on the value YL of the sample. So if you have a sample of size M and if you don't re do reuses, the, number, the maximal number of steps you can do is M. And of course, I have to describe the initialization. Let's say for the moment it's random under a distribution mu. And of course, you want to understand the evolution in the regime where both the dimension of the parameter space P and the dimension of the data space D, so P for parameter, D for data, are large, but when M, the size of the sample, is not too large, right? So the number of steps you can do is not enormous. So you cannot have a regime where you do exponentially many steps, right? Because you, you don't have that much data. So a bit of history, then this goes back at now 70 years. And uh, the, the work is enormous. Of course, in the classical, what I would call the classical setting is when the, 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 the dimension P and D are fixed and capital M tends to infinity. So that's well known. And the asymptotic theory is, uh, and stochastic approximations more broadly uh, are very classical. And at the core is the, the idea that in this limit, when the step size or when the learning rate goes to zero, the trajectory of the SGD, uh, probably uh, rescaled, converges to the gradient flow of the population loss. Right? So that's the idea. So you, and, you, and then if you hope that the gradient flow of the population loss will go to what you want, then this should do the same. Now, that's the meta theorem that is always true okay, under a different type of assumptions. Then um, you know more than that. You know these passwise limit theorems, but you know functional central limit theorems. You know the fluctuations around that. And you even know large deviations if you want to. So that is completely classical and has been now for a long time. Uh, you know, the last progress on general things like that was probably in the 90s. Uh, wait a minute, what did I do here? Yeah. Oh, no. Yes. So now we're trying to understand what's happening in the high dimensional setting where uh, the, the amount of data is constrained. D, uh, D and P are large, but M is not too large. And um, so the, the, the high dimensional nature of the data may be in the high dimensional nature of the parameter and maybe the complexity of the model you're being trained. So in this regime, you cannot simply take the learning rate to be arbitrarily small because you have a very limited size of the sample. So uh, this choice of the learning rate is also a problem. And so there is a common, I mean, this is a very common thing in uh, high dimensional statistics and and, uh, you know, I give here an old reference about this. So, okay, so I just mentioned here quickly some uh, progress in all sorts of different limits in this thing. So we heard, in fact, this morning, this thing about mean field. So, for instance, uh, we saw this work mentioning uh, Eric van den Eyden and, and uh, Grant Rotskoff and the work by Montanari, et cetera, Shiza and, and others. For, uh, okay, so I will go fast on that. There are uh, been some interesting progress for non-convex objectives, and I mentioned a few, uh, but we want to understand this in general. So, uh, so here are some other works, that in particular the one that I mentioned in the team of uh, Florent Jacala and Lenkaj de Borova. And of course, you also could think of the very old work, which goes back to spin glass theory, which is DMFT. So uh, dynamical mean field theory, that is Cugliano de Lucosian in the 90s. And of course, all the mathematical progress that came after that. It's an important thing to understand. This literature in the physics world, DMFT, was, was not for SGD, it was for Langevin, but uh, it was also looking at the case where the time was short. Right? They were not looking at the, at the aging, at the very long time scale that are natural, natural in these things at low temperature. They were looking at short times, right? And that's what we are looking at here. Okay, so let me now go to what we are doing here. So the question, so I will introduce this new notion of, I mean, it's not that new, it was already in the paper in, uh, in, in 2022, of summary statistics and effective dynamics. So careful, these words are new. It, it's not, I'm saying summary and not sufficient. Right? Because sufficient statistics means something in statistics. I don't want to imply that it's the same thing. And same thing for effective. So 
I will first describe what we do here in, uh, in, in words, and then I will go to the, to the definition. So the first question about the behavior of SGD in high dimension is first to even understand how you state the limit theorem. Right? So when you're in the mean field limit and you go to measures, uh, that's one thing. But here, how do you do that? You have a flow in dimension n. The dimension is going to infinity or in dimension d, whatever. And the, the dimension is going to infinity. What does it mean that it converges? So, uh, so, so of course, you could maybe what you do normally in physics in this kind of thing, when your quantities are exchangeable, typically you go to the mean field thing. You look at the empirical measure and you, this defines the measure. This measure converges to something. You have convergence in the space of measure. Here, there's no reason to do that. This thing is not exchangeable and usual. So the empirical measure does not characterize completely the thing. So you don't really know how to do it. But so typically, of course, if you do a series SGD, you will have your, I don't know, your parameter space. Let me just take numbers. And I have two favorite numbers. One is 10 to the 9. OK, so you're in 10 to the 9 dimension. That's your thing. You want to follow this flow. How can you describe it? But of course, the main thing is that you don't really care. You don't, of course, you don't want to follow the, the flow of all the 10 to the 9 parameters. Typically, you want much less than that. So that's the idea of summary statistics. In most problems, you don't need or you don't want to follow the full parameter in R to the P along the path of SGD, but only maybe a few uh, finite dimensional projection of that, a few of these parameters. So, because that's what will describe what you really want. So the equation, uh, the question arises of having asymptotically autonomous evolutions. If you have a dynamical system, SGD, let's even imagine it's a gradient flow. You have an ODE. If you take a projection of it, normally it's not autonomous. There's no reason for that. Otherwise, physics would be very simple. But here, we will call summary statistics things that are, that define autonomous projections, right? Of course, if I just say that, it's stupid. I could take the projection to zero, then it's autonomous, but does not describe much, right? So we also need this to describe important things. So we call them summary statistics. And so they could include, for instance, the value of the loss, some distance between the, 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 what your, the state of your SGD and the ground truth, where you want to go, uh, maybe the amplitude of certain weights, and maybe some spectral statistics, whatever. So, so what we do is we introduce a, a formal definition of summary statistics. Formal definition means Something is a summary statistics if it's dynamic, the projection of the dynamics obtained by SGD are autonomous. So we want, we have a kind of Bourbaki like definition. If these things are satisfied, then the, then the projection is autonomous. Okay? And that can ensure that the evolution of a few parameters could be as autonomous asymptotically. And of course, they are not exactly autonomous. So when would that be true? Let's imagine for a moment that, that your, in fact, your population loss, the function you, are, you try to find, the minimum of, is in fact, it's, it's a function of 10 to the 9 variable, but in fact, it's mainly a function of 17 variable and plus a, a small thing, right? So then naturally, you would imagine that it's possible that the evolution of this, it would be nice if the projection of, on these 17 variables were autonomous. That's the notion of summary statistics, okay? Uh, uh, all right, so, so we prove then that under regularity assumption, the evolution of the summary statistics converges uh, when the dimension is very large to the solution of a system of differential equation, possibly stochastic, very often degenerate. And this limiting dynamical system now. So now you have this thing in dimension 10 to the 9. You project in dimension 17. And in this 17 dimension, then the, the, you obtain an autonomous dynamical system and this dynamical system will rule the day. That's what we try to explain. All the single index model I was describing before, right? let's say phase retrieval or whatever, or uh, tensor PCA, were cases where the, this dimension of this autonomous system was one. So in dimension one, dynamical systems are not very interesting, very simple to classify. That's what we did with the information exponent. But as soon as you go to dimension 3, 4, 17, this dynamical system can be very rich. 
even though it's not in a diverging dimension, it can be comp complex and interesting. Okay, so this is what I'm saying here. This, this limiting dynamics in this uh, finite projection, we call effective dynamics. These effective dynamics depend very importantly on the initialization. That's why you heard me asking always, what is your initialization? They depend very much on the parameter re region in which you're developing the scaling limit. And they depend very much on the scaling of the step size. So what we find, so that's the definition. I didn't give a formal one, but that's the idea. We have these projections that are autonomous when they exist. And what we find is that the, this uh, SGD, this projection exhibit typically two phases in training, ballistic phase, where the summary statistics macroscopically change in value, and diffusive phase, where they fluctuate microscopically. microscopically. And during training, the evolution can start with either. You can start with a ballistic or a diffusive phase. You can even alternate multiple times between these things. And you can, our approach allows to develop scaling limits in each type of these phases. In the ballistic phases, the effective dynamics are given by an ODE. That's why we call it ballistic. And the finite dimensional intuition, the, the classical regime, that, the, that the, 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 the SGD goes to the flow of uh, the gradient flow of the population loss is essentially true. The summary statistics evolve under the gradient flow for the population loss. It's, it's correct if the learning rate is sufficiently small in the dimension. So what we find is that you have a range of learning rates of step size, if you want, where, where below a certain critical regime, what you obtain is the same as what you would have in the classical regime, right? Where the dimension does not diverge for this projected thing. Ah. But when you are at the edge of this thing, when you are above this, the thing is unstable. And when you are at the edge, when you have this critical learning rate, then uh, the, you, you get something new. The intuition you have in finite dimension is wrong. You get more terms in your dynamical system. And these terms are very important. They are very useful. They are the one that will allow you to escape the bad regions. Okay. So by the way, I keep hearing all the time that the problem with all these things is getting trapped in minima, in local minima. That's not at all the problem, never in those things. The problem is escaping entropy, always. That's what we're describing here. Once you project in this finite dimension things, then indeed there you may have minima in this few variables. But in, when you take, for instance, let's go back to tensor PC, whatever single index model, the hard part is not to escape minima if you're looking at short times. You never reach a minimum. You don't find the local minima. The real hard problem is to escape mediocrity, to escape entropy, right? which is a, a different thing. So here, this additional correction term gives a phase portrait for this limiting dynamical system, projected dynamical system, which is different. And, and this is important for the result. So once you have this, then you, what you can do is you can zoom to what we study here, that you can zoom on the microscopic neighborhoods on this fixed point of this dynamics in dimension 17, the effective dynamics, and then you, you, find a new, you apply your theorem anew, and then you find, uh, you can understand how sticky those regions are, how long, how long it takes to get away from them, right? So again, if you had, if you have in mind things like a single index model, you would have one point in dimension one, which will be sticky. And the region is how do you get away from that? Very simple. You have to count how many derivatives there are not zero, right? Which is uh, here, of course, it's more complicated in general. So these rescaled effective dynamics often become diffusive. They are given by stochastic differential equation. They have a wide range of behaviors. And, uh, and they explain essentially the performance of the system. So that's the idea of those effective uh, summary statistics. So for, then I will describe here more precisely what they are mathematically. But then at this point, I've not told you how, what, how that is related to the spectral statistic, right, to the spectral transition. So the real problem you have with this, so what I just described here is completely Bourbaki. It's just if certain conditions are satisfied, you have autonomous projections, and these autonomous projections may be interesting. 
But first, the real question is how do you find these, these things? You're in dimension 10 to the 9. How do you find the 17 proper variables? Right? That's, so in the examples we first treated in the first paper, that was easy because the models we had chosen had uh, sufficient statistics. In fact, the model depended only on the finite number of, of parameters. So you could guess what they were. What we do in the second work that Okosh described here that we just said that the system just does it by itself. And it does it with the only tool, only tool that the system has, which is spectral transition, which is the BBP transition, which is along the trajectory of your optimization path. If you look at either the Hessian of the function you're trying to minimize, along the trajectory. You don't want to compute this Hessian in the whole space. In dimension 10 to the 9, you would need an enormous number of computation so just along the trajectory. Or even if you don't want to compute the Hessian, if you just compute the gram matrix, when you do your, your optimization, you compute a gradient at every point. Now you take a big part, uh, you, you take a, a long section of your dynamics, you have a long, large number of gradients. Right? With that, you make a matrix. And you compute this matrix times it's transpose. That is, you compute the singular values. You look at the spectrum of this, right? This is a first order thing. These two things, the Gram matrix, which I just described, and the Hessian matrix, what I'm saying here, and that, that's the content of this second paper, the one that Okosh explained, after an initial phase, which is short in all the examples we give here, the, you see a dynamical BBP, this Hessian exhibits outliers. And the eigenspace corresponding to these outliers, when the outliers are far, essentially give you summary statistics. That is, the projection on this outlier space is essentially autonomous. And this dynamical system in dimension 17, if you have 17 outliers, rules the system. Okay? So of course you expect that, in fact, if you, the signal you want to capture is rank 17, that at some point you will have 17 outliers. But maybe you don't have that many. Right? So we will see that. OK, so first, before we go to the spectral thing, let me come back here to the formal definition. Summary statistics. So let me remind you that we're studying the, the SGD with step size delta. And um, so suppose that you're given a function. That will be the summary statistics u, which project from rp to rk. p is 10 to the 9, k is 17. and um, and the goal is to understand a possible autonomous evolution of u of xt, this projection. So you take the interpolation of this thing, and you want to prove that this u of t converges in distribution and identify the limit. So to have such a scaling limit, you need some notation. I introduce capital H, which is the loss function, minus its mean. So that's the centered loss. Remember, phi was the mean. And we, so we view h as a random function of x, and I call k the gradient of this, and v the covariance matrix of this gradient. And I denote j the Jacobian matrix of u. OK, so that's a lot of notations. And then I define the following first order and second order different of operator. The divergence thing with phi, and this uh, second order thing with v. And uh, written differently, you just have A, which is grad phi grad, and L, which is one half of V grad square. And then I, I assume that, you know, this thing, so that this, uh, uh, where is the pointer here? That this A plus delta, that's the time span. So I put an N here to remember that everything, to remind you that everything depends on N. On u minus some h of u, there exists an h, reasonable, locally Lipschitz. So this is essentially equal to that. This converges locally uniformly to 0 on some exhaustion of compact set. Forget that. And that this is essentially a function of u. So that's very, you know, not surprising. I want uh, autonomous dynamics. I assume that this thing, this thing has no, I assume that this is essentially a function of u and that this is essentially a function of u. Okay. Then, I need some other condition, so that's the Bourbaki side. I need all these things bounds on, on, on derivatives. You can't read that, but you know it's there. And uh, then we call this uh, otherwise a localizing sequence. 
Then we assume, of course, we have to assume something on the initial condition. So we, I assume that the projection from dimension 10 to the 9 to 17 of the, initial, of the initialization converges to something, right? And then the, the, the main result is this, which is then the evolution is autonomous and is given by this SDE. H of u, which was this limit of something, and this sigma of u, which was the limit of something else. Okay? In most cases, we'll see this sigma will be zero. Right? It will just be an ODE. So this tells you under these conditions, you have an autonomous system in this projected thing. Okay. Again, this is not necessarily very smart. Take u to be zero, the theorem applies, right? d0 equals zero. But, so it's not necessarily an interesting system. You want uh, an interesting result. You want this to apply for, for statistic view that will help you describe what, what's happening. Okay, so, uh, so if you assume that in fact, each of the two terms, A and L, delta N, L, N, U converge individually, and I call F and G those limits, so we call this F, so then this, what I call H will be minus, G minus F, I call F the population drift, G the population corrector, and sigma the diffusion matrix. Okay, so, uh, okay, so f the fixed dimensional perspective where you are not in diverging dimension, what you should obtain here is this equation. You should have the corrector G should be zero, trust me, and the diffusion sigma should be zero. You should have this ODE, okay? So that's the, that would be the evolution under the, the gradient descent, when you have this projection. So that is what you would expect in good cases. And I said it could happen that you have a corrector and that you have a, a, a stochastic term. So, uh, that's what I'm saying here. The population corrector and the diffusion matrix are zero in this perspective here. So this is not always true. If this thing lets me move. Okay. So the subcritical regime I mentioned is that when you have a triple ULP, whatever, then there is a scaling of the learning rate where when you are below a scaling, this corrector G and this diffusion matrix sigma are zero. So you obtain the usual thing. And so the effective dynamics agree with the population dynamics. We call that subcritical. But there is a critical regime, the edge of this regime, where G and sigma may not be zero. And then you have these non-trivial corrections I mentioned. So how do you find this thing? So, uh, Okay, let me just skip that. So there, let me just say that this implies that there is this critical regime, there is only one. Right? You cannot uh, do that. If you have a regime where you have a G and a sigma, if you take a smaller time step, G and sigma will disappear. And if you take a larger time step, the, the regime will become, this thing will become unstable. This, the limit theorem will, be, will disappear. So the ballistic versus diffusive regime, that's, so I call it uh, uh, ballistic. It's uh, when you don't have a diffusion case, and so you just have this. And so it's just this dynamical system, which is not necessarily the projection of the gradient flow. And um, so that's typically, you know, then the, the, the here this, uh, the land scale of order one and the time scale of order one over delta, where delta in your, is your time step. Okay. If, so let, let, me, let me say that this is telling you that you can zoom. I will forget this zooming thing because it's too complicated and I need time to go to the other thing. What, what I'm just telling you that when you zoom, you obtain new dynamics where you could have different H and different sigma. Okay. So, so let me just give you the, some examples so that we can see what we're doing here. All right. So the first one is tensor PCA, because that's our matrix PCA. So let me explain that. We didn't need this to do it, of course. But uh, so you take a spike uh, matrix or a spike tensor model. So this is abundantly studied. I give a few references here. 
So here it is. So here I'm taking a rank one perturbation. So you have here, so what you want to understand, the parameter here is this u. u is a vector, let's say a unit vector. And now k, all right, so the, uh, from this vector u, you construct a rank one tensor, u to the k. Let's say k is three. So you construct a rank three, ten, uh, uh, a three tensor of rank one, okay, u to the three. And this is what you want to, 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 let's say, estimate, and it's unknown. What you have, the data you have is a sample of this tensor, rank one, it's a, very simple, perturbed by noise. So W are now three tensors, and let's say who's pure noise. The entries are all independent, and they're all, let's say, Gaussian-centered. That's what I assume here. So, and lambda is just a signal-to-noise ratio. I could put it in the variance of the Ws. I will assume that the variance of the W is fixed. Let's say one. So sigma measures, the larger the sigma, the smaller the variance, which means the less noise. So when sigma lambda is large, you have a lot of signal. Okay, let's see. Okay. So here, so you have to do this thing. You want to estimate U. So you know the story. There is a regime of lambdas for which, from the information, when lambda is too small, from the inf an information theory point of view, you simply ca cannot estimate u, right? The distribution of this thing with u or without u are essentially their distance goes to zero, total variation distance, so you cannot estimate. Then when you are above this information theory threshold, you can try all sorts of statistics. So here we do the plain vanilla statistics, we do uh, maximum likelihood, the stupidest statistics. So if you take maximum likelihood estimation, you have to, you look at the loss and the loss is just this. And you try to hope that the maximum likelihood thing would give you, would allow you to correlate with you. Okay, and the answer is that there is a threshold for that. And this threshold is the same. As soon as uh, the information theory threshold, by luck. As soon as something works, maximum likelihood works. So as soon as any statistical procedure works, the stupidest procedure works. So, the, uh, so in this model, how would you b use, but then the next question, of course, is you want to find the real problem here is you want to find the maximum likelihood. It's easy to say, take the maximum likelihood, but you have to find the maximum of, of this likelihood or the minimum of negative likelihood, right? And this, of course, you do by an optimization, stochastic gradient descent or whatever you want, and this is hard. And you know, there is a big gap between the statistical threshold and the computational threshold, right? Which is an order, this gap is of order n to the k minus two over two. Okay, so it's diverging with n. So there's a whole region where uh, the algorithm would work if you were able to find the minimum, but you can't. You can't, of course, in short time. If you wait for an exponential time, you will. But, but anyway, so what are the summary statistics in this case? Very simple. It's, oops, sorry. One is just this. This is the overlap, this is the angle, if you want, between the true. So imagine you're in this big dim high dimensional sphere, the one you want to find, the U you want to find at the North Pole, you, you, and what you're looking at at the state of your thing is X, it's that just the angle between the two, right? So that's, a, which of course is the same as computing the distance between the two if you're on the sphere. And uh, the other one would be possibly this, uh, this thing, because here I didn't fix the, the radius of the sphere. So if you take these two summer statistics, then you find uh, uh, effective dynamics. You can just do the whole thing, and they are exactly solvable. And when the step size uh, critically with the dimension, in the ballistic phase, these dynamics have interesting behavior. And with that, you can explain essentially the, the whole story, plus some ghost regimes that I don't want to spend too much time here. So let me explain again what the problem here is here. Let's imagine for a moment that, that I don't have this second statistics S, which essentially fixes the radius. If you're on a sphere, when you initialize randomly, you have a cold start, you're typically on the equator. If you want to go to the North Pole, you start on the equator. And if you start on the equator, the question is, how do you escape? So you look at the projection on the latitude this projection M, that's your summary statistics. If you look at the dynamical system for this guy, this dynamical system is essentially starting from a point zero, that's the equator, 
the latitude zero. And then at this point, your dynamical system, this is a stable point. You don't escape, you don't move. Happily, when you start at random, you start at the distance one over root n of this thing. So that allows you to escape, but the escape is slow. That explains the statistical gap, right? So that's, you didn't need all this story to know that. This was already well known and well understood. And it's the same picture for other single index model. Right? Single index means you have this one dimensional projection, which is simple. Okay, so here I, 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 we know more, but let, let me just skip that. So a more interesting thing was that we did in this paper in Europe in 2022 was this XOR thing. So XOR becomes more interesting. So you take an XOR classification of a Gaussian mixture. So you take a, a two-layer uh, neural net. And so, of course, it's an it's a XOR, as you know. It's a, it's a canonical example of a decision boundary requiring at least two layers. And as you know, this is what the second death of machine, of, of machine learning was due to this example right, in the 90s. Because before that, people were doing perceptrons one layer, and then there's one layer this didn't work. You needed two layers. So, it's a, so here's the thing, you have your data is given by an AED sample where the little yi's are uh, Bernoulli one half and the xi's are given by Gaussian mixtures. So when y is one, x is a mixture of two Gaussian with mean mu and negative mu. When y is zero, x is a mixture of Gaussian nu and negative nu. Okay, so that's the, so you either have two Gaussians like this or two Gaussians like that, right? And you have your, your population here, P is a half. So we didn't put a, a bias so that one is more than the other, it's half. So then you do the classification with the two layer networks uh, and then you use the cross entropy loss. And here, so this here I completely describe, I'm sure you can read what this means. I start with my data, I apply the weight, I have one, one weight here. I, I apply here the, uh, the Fortin G and then uh, in a product, and then I take sigma to be the sigmoid function. And G, of course, here is simply the ReLU activation function, X plus. So it's a really classical two-layer thing. And uh, with that, the loss is given by that. If you compute it, I have here uh, a regularization, as we've all seen, and an L2 regularization. So that's the function you want to minimize. And then you, 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 when, when you look at this, the law of this loss depends on 22 parameters, right? So here I take the second layer, for those who follow this, the second layer is the smallest possible size, four, when you have x4, when you have x4. So when you have four, the, 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 this loss depends on 22 parameters, and I tell you which one they are, they are here. So naturally you can say, let's follow these 22 parameters, okay? And in fact, the, the ballistic, in fact, the dynamics are in less than 22, they are in 14 or 16, I forgot. But anyway, this dynamical system, so now if you apply this abstract nonsense theorem, you have dynamics in dimension 22, and in fact a little less, and they are very rich. In this landscape, in this phase diagram, if you want, for this 22 dimensional thing, in fact you have 39 connected components of fixed points. So regions that are trapping, bad for you, Right? If the algorithm starts there, you're dead. It doesn't go to where you want to go. And, uh, you know, 24 of these places are trapping. 24 are stable out of this 39. Okay? And when you start at random, when you start at random in dimension 10 to the 9, and you project in this dimension 22, you could very well start in any of these. Right? You don't start in one in particular. So the question is now, how does it work in this dynamical system in dimension 22 or less, in fact, 14? And what is the probability when you start at random to get to the, to the real place, which is where you have the minimum? And uh, if you initialize the weights Gaussianly, randomly, so we take Gaussian here, then the algorithm, the SGD here, will converge to a bad classifier. So a classifier with a macroscopic generalization error with probability 29 out of 32. So we are so proud of this number, right? Because in probability, you either have probability zero or one, but we, you love 29 out of the 32. So when k is equal to four, and then it follows a, a degenerate diffusion. So 
the, prob the probability of good classification is positive, three out of 32. All right, so let's think one minute. So it, I don't want to describe too much this dynamical system. It's fantastically interesting, but let's just say, just take this for granted. So first, do you think it's good news or bad news? Hmm? Bad news. That's what, of course, what I thought too. In fact, it's good news. No, but I exactly was like you. So why? Because, of course, remember, you're Google. You're hiring that number of interns, more than 32 people, right? And each of them runs. I will have three out of that will succeed. As soon as I have one that succeeds, I'm happy. Then I discard all the other training things. <laughs> one has succeeded. I know how to config to the configuration of my network, the weights I should take. And then it works. Right? So that's the important thing that I didn't get. And of course, I needed to talk to people who do work in the industry to tell me this is what you want. Okay? But okay, let's stay mathematicians for a minute. You want this probability to be one. So if you let the second layer, K, then, uh, become large, go to infinity, then in fact, that is you do over-parameterization, seriously, then this probability of success goes from three out of 32 to one exponentially fast with K. So having a very large K gives you a probability of success which is close to one. Again, that's, a, uh, that's what I'm saying here. All right, so the, another way is to understand when you are with k small, you do your initialization, and sometimes you fall in a bad region, which is trapping. Then what you can do is use what I skipped, which is the zooming of your dynamical system there, rescale your dynamical system, and understand it locally. And uh, this is possible, depends on the region, and you get a whole range of behaviors. And in, in every bad initialization region, so you're not lucky, you started with something which is in a bad region, then the end result is a need for more data in order to escape this sticky region, but not, not exponentially, uh, just usually polynomially and maybe sometimes just logarithmically. Right? You need a little more data to have time to escape these, these bad regions and you understand exactly how it works using this projected dynamics, this summary statistics. Um, okay, let me forget this binary mixture. Okay, so this example, the XOR example is cool and fun and interesting, but, and respected as an important problem, but, and also surprising, because why do you have uh, this number of critical things? But again, you had the fact, how did we find this summer statistics? We had a very good, uh, guess because the distribution depended only on a finite number of parameters. So in general, we don't know. So this is when the BBP transition comes. So the next question, of course, is to find these summary statistics. And not only that they are autonomous, but they are meaningful. Right? So when the loss function is not as explicit as we had here. So um, one natural idea is spectral. So you follow, this is what I explained, you follow the spectrum along the trajectory of the SGD, which is the minimum thing you can do, right? You, you, you follow this trajectory, and along this trajectory, you compute the spectrum of the Gram matrix, or maybe of the Hessian matrix. And in the right regime and in the right parameter zones, you could hope for a BBP dynamical transition, where the top modes, the top eigenvalues of these uh, random matrices along the trajectory uh, we will be outliers, will be far from the bulk, okay? And then you expect that the uh, outlier eigenspace may carry an autonomous dynamics and give you all the information about the dynamical system. So what's the intuition again? This means something like, like you know, that's what BBP is about. BBP started with PCA, principal, I mean, that's the basic thing in statistics, principal component analysis. So what does it mean? It means that in fact, the function you're trying to minimize, even though it's a function of 10 to the 9 variable, is really a function of 17 variable, right? Plus a small perturbation in the 10 to the 9 minus 17 variables. If this is the case, then obviously the Hessian should have outliers. 
and the gram matrix too, right? But you don't have to know which the directions are, are, they are. The system knows, right? So this is what we hope, and this is what's, what, what is happening. So what we say is that in this case, when you project on the outliers, applying the results I mentioned before, you prove that these outliers are kind of uh, summary statistics. When you project these dynamics on the outliers, on the 17 outliers, will be uh, autonomous and will be interesting and rich. So this was done numerically first in a paper that is almost not quoted, but which is numerically uh, hard, done by Papian in 2018, and in, then in a more theoretical work with, by Papian and Han and Donohoe. So what Papian did was exactly that. He, followed, he didn't follow the Gram matrix, he followed the Hessian matrix for a simple classification, K, K, KGMM classification, and which is not easy, right? Because you compute the Hessian all along the trajectory and he, he, he observed the, this uh, BBP transition. The spectrum, the bulk here, is not something simple like uh, some historical or Wishart distribution. The bulk is crazy, but you don't care because what you care about are the outliers. What he also observed numerically and what we proved is that you also have in a regime, you have also a mini bulk. So you have a big bulk, a mini bulk, and outliers. So where is the mini bulk coming from? If you have K directions that are, you know, the, let's say you're doing a classification of K classes, then your dynamics should be in the space of these K classes, but, but when you have something in dimension K, the Hessian will be, K, you will have K square uh, dimension here. So something, but this out, this, but when you are, when the, when the transition is really marked, the, the outliers are really away from the mini bulk and, and that's okay. Anyway, so this is where, uh, so this is now done rigorously uh, for this more complex classification task and deeper network in this joint work. And so what we prove is this dynamical emergence of the BBP transition, right? And if you look back at the PCA thing, when I was describing with the, uh, it's exactly the same thing. You want to get to the North Pole. If you want to look at it spectrally, you start at the equator, and then you have your dynamics climbing. When you are in the regime where you begin to escape the equator, right, then you see that your Hessian, for instance, will develop an outlier which will be correlated with the North Pole, precisely. Right? So that's, uh, that's not, over there you didn't need to know that, it was a consequence. But, but in general, this is always what happens. Okay. By the way, this work, which I will not have time to talk about, this more recent work with Gerbelo and Cédric Gerbelo and Vanessa Piccolo, is about the behavior of tensor PCA when you have not a rank one, but a rank, seven, a rank 18 perturbation, so things are more complicated. Okay, so we uh, study there the interplay between these training dynamics, the SGD, and the spectral decomposition of the empirical Hessian or the Gram matrix. And what we show is the following thing. So we take two canonical high dimensional classification tasks for K hidden class, the K Gaussian mixture model and some XOR. And so what we see is the following. So let me, instead of giving you theorems, which I trust Okosh gave you the theorems, so let me just you, give you what the theorems say. So it, shortly into training, the empirical Hessian and the empirical Gram matrix have a certain number of outlier eigenvalues, which I call C of K. And the SGD essentially works predominantly in their eigenspace this of dimension C of K. Here, this C of K is explicit and depends on all sorts of things. It doesn't have to be, here the signal is dimension K. You want to find the, uh, the K center of the classes. It's, it's, it's rank K. It's not necessarily that, because it could very well be. So that, you know, it, it, let's, it could very well be that your signal, that your, in your, your BBP transition, if you take a classical BBP transition, some of the modes could be still hidden in the bulk, right? When you take a random matrix, let's say the simplest thing, a random Wigner matrix plus a finite rank thing, finite rank 17, it could very well be that you have only five outliers 
and 12, 12 of these things are still hidden in the bulk. That's the BBP transition. The BBP transition is not to say that you have 17 guys out. The BBP transition is to understand how they come out. And the important thing in the BBP thing, in the elementary BBP thing of 20 years ago, is that it could very well be that the random matrix has eaten the signal and doesn't let it go. Right? So it could be defective, deficient. Right? The C, you may not necessarily capture the whole thing. Okay? So then, uh, second thing, when you have a multi-layer setting, then for this classification task, the align this alignment with the outliers happen within each layer. Right? So you have a layer-wise behavior of these things. And third, this alignment is not predicated on success at the classification task. Right? This thing could, so when the SGD converges, in fact, to a suboptimal classifier, but then the, that's just what I explained, the empirical Hessian and the, and the Gram matrix have lower, lower rank outlier eigenspaces, and the SGD works in this lower dimensional thing and does not capture the whole system. Okay, so let me give you another example. Let's take tensor PCA again, or matrix PCA if you want, but let's take tensor PCA. But imagine now that your thing, instead of being on rank two, is of rank three, the signal you want to capture. It could be that your signal is strong enough that the three modes are out, and then you have dy dynamics in dimension three. It could be that only one has gotten out, and that two are still hidden in the bulk, and these two you cannot capture. It could be that two are very close. Then they say the first one is much bigger and two are very close. So what you will see is that one will come out first and then you capture this vector. But then the two, the next two will come out together later, right? which means you need more data. And then they might emerge together. You will have now a dynamical system in dimension two and it's not clear that you can estimate individually each of the two if they are very close, right? So this dynamical system, this reduced dynamical system you get has all the information, but all the information you can get. Because again, the real reason why you have this IT threshold is precisely that the, that the BBP thing can hide signal, okay? So it's not, it doesn't mean that you will necessarily capture the whole signal, right? But you will capture everything there is to capture. Right? And if you have more time or more signal to noise ratio, then you will capture the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>